I made some video games. I've been making games for 10 years on and off. I went away for it for a while to focus on some other stuff, but you probably noticed that I'm kind of back with a vengeance now. So back in the day, was I ever any good? Well, let's talk game design. If you've seen any of my other videos, you might be under the impression that I'm a seasoned veteran of game design who has a pretty firm grasp on what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. This is sort of true and I'm pretty confident in my abilities now. Because it's a new year, I thought it might be fun to look back on some of the stuff I made a decade ago to chart my progression as a game designer. I did think it might be fun and then I actually sat down and played them and cringed so hard I almost shrank out of existence. Before we get into this, there are a few things I need to make you aware of. These are all game jam games made for various game jams that were happening at the time. That means they were made in at most 48 hours. Many of them had significantly less. I couldn't draw. I've never been able to draw. I still can't draw and these days I've basically stopped trying to draw. But back in the day I thought I could get by on my god awful art skills because graphics don't matter. Some of these games were made as far back as 10 years ago. I was a very different person back then with different values. Much worse game development skills and a naive sense of self confidence that I sort of envy now. I leaned heavily on voice acting. I thought I was funny. I really did. Maybe I was. Maybe I am now. I don't know. But what I do know is when the timer was running out on the game jam, I had a tendency to reach for my very cheap microphone and start spouting nonsense into audacity. If you've watched my video on entering the Ludum Dare game jam with my game about roundabouts and British seaside holidays, you'll notice that hasn't really changed. Right, I can't put it off anymore, so we might as well start with the first one. What I'll do is show off and summarise each game, then try and comment on something positive that I can take from it, in the hopes of rescuing my fractured and shattered ego. Then I'll give you about 20 seconds of gameplay so you can get all the experience of playing it yourself, without the mind-numbing misery of actually having to play it yourself. I was obsessed with mazes. I don't know why, but for a while I went through a period of thinking maze-based game design was the next hot trend, and people were missing a trick by not slapping some big square walls in all of their games, and making the player wander about aimlessly for half an hour. The idea behind Multiversia is to shift between planes of existence, collecting something to rebuild all of reality. Somehow I decided this was best represented by rotating glowing squares. Another thing I was obsessed with was the glow effect, because it was something I could slap on a basic square to make it look not entirely awful. This is probably one of the least offensive games in the list because it's just meh. It's not even especially bad, other than the fact that there's no minimap or anything, so you've got no idea where you're going. If I was going to take something positive from this, it's probably the visuals. Even way back then I'd started to learn the importance of contrast, and how you can cover up a lack of art skill with creative use of colour. Also I guess at the time I must have really hated colourblind people, because I can't imagine this makes much sense to them. I'd just like to apologise to the entire colourblind community. <laughs> I can't remember what game inspired this, but I do remember wanting to make something thoughtful, deep and mature sort of like Limbo. So I drew a sprite that had a whopping two frames of animation, I think I ripped off some music from Final Fantasy, and I set up this little prototype that had a monochrome colour scheme and these really pretentious cutaways to some guy's thoughts about death. That's cheerful isn't it? I suppose the mood of this was heading in the right direction. I understood how to set tone even if I didn't understand how to actually do it, and the game is shorter than this sentence so at least it ends quickly. Oh god. This was themed after a Simpsons joke where they're on a Japanese game show called the Happy Smile Super Challenge Family Wish Show. Oh, that hurts. Why are you doing this to me and please let me die? Except I couldn't make games very well, so the only thing I could do was stick coloured squares onto badly drawn dolls. That's it, that's the game. 
you get more or less points based on where you put the stickers and at some point really randomly the doll will spring to life like buckaroo and you'll get a jump scare with a wilhelm scream then you win a random consolation prize and start all over again there's absolutely no skill involved whatsoever other than just hammering the mouse button in the head and face area and hoping for the best you also win some hilarious consolation prizes like a plain cheese pizza or sweden if i was going to salvage something positive from this it'd be the fact that it's very quick you go from a game over to playing again at the speed of light so there's no time to get frustrated and i guess the light-hearted nature of the game keeps your emotional investment low. This one actually has an excuse for being awful because technically it was made in literally zero time. There was an event called the Zero Hour Game Jam. The idea is that on the day the clocks went back, you had that hour to make a game. And because the clocks went back, technically you'd made that game in zero time. The upshot of all this is I had an hour to make this game, at a time when I could barely move a sprite around a screen. This is one of the best examples of my desire to ramble into a microphone, pitch shift my own voice and slap that in as voice acting. It's only a minute long so I'm just going to let it play in its entirety so you get the full experience. Hello, thank you so much for helping me collect cake. It really does cheer me up. I've been having quite a hard time lately. My girlfriend left me for a brontosaurus. Apparently they're quite a bit bigger. I don't really know what's bigger than a T-Rex, but I guess I'll never really understand how women work anyway. Which is quite sad, really. You'd think I'd have lots of friends, being a T-Rex with a jetpack. But it's really quite hard to make any real lasting friends because all they want to do is have a go on your jetpack which is you know it's nice at first to be wanted but then you think well do they really want me or do they want the jetpack all I know is I want cake and I thank you very much for helping me get it you're a true friend and I love you I think yes I do I love you thank you very much have a lovely day. Yes, for some reason, I made a game about a lovesick dinosaur with a jetpack who was comfort eating to get over a breakup. I'm not too hard on this one because, like I said, it was made in technically zero time. I think the gameplay is pretty accessible, the concept's nice and simple, and it works, which is more than can be said for some games I made. Speaking of accessibility, I think this was made for a game jam where the whole point was that you couldn't have any text in your game. This tripped me up a bit because I usually just stick any tutorial instructions on the title screen in a wall of exposition. So instead I made this visual representation of a mouse. That's a mouse, that's what that is. You play as a tank, shooting aliens that look suspiciously like the poop emoji, and try and stop them from hitting the yellow border around the screen. Every time you pass around, the border shrinks until, well until it doesn't, and then the game restarts. But there's no score, so it just goes on forever. There's also no sound or music, but depending on how you feel about my voice acting and music skills, that might be a positive. As hideous as this is, I think the concept is pretty neat. I think it succeeds in being accessible at least, which is nice. I also like that when you die you get this harrowing portrait of a crying emoji. That's fun. I have almost zero memory of this game, so it must be an old one. I can't remember what jam it was for, I can't remember what I was trying to do, and I certainly don't remember making it. I assume from the title Griswold is supposed to be a viking because he's throwing axes at what I think are meant to be meteors threatening to destroy earth. It goes on forever because for whatever reason I didn't bother to make it get any harder. It's got no music, no sound, no title screen, no in-game explanation of the controls, no anything, really. It's probably the worst game on this list, and having seen this list I'm sure you can appreciate how much of a damning criticism that is. This one's much better. The game jam I made it for had a theme that was something like indirect control. So I came up with this idea of having a giant robot that you controlled with a remote. It's got upgrades, hand-drawn graphics, and me doing the sound effects with my mouth. This one's genuinely all right, I think. What I like about it is how I played with the idea of multitasking in an active way. Sort of like a real-time strategy game, because your shield and lasers only regenerate when they're switched off. You have to balance movement, building destruction, jumping on tanks, shooting down helicopters, and protecting yourself with the shield all at the same time, which makes the game genuinely kind of hectic and not awful. The only problem is it's got an upgrade system and it's really unbalanced so you become overpowered in minutes and then the challenge of the game goes out the window. Still I'm quite pleased with it and I think there's some ideas in there that might be worth revisiting one day. <laughs> Done. 
Of all the games I'm showcasing today, this is by far my favourite one. It's a multi-chapter, multi-genre science fiction epic about an action hero of a man doing what action heroes do, saving the world from an alien invasion. Except the plot has dramatic twists in it that you'd find in, I assume, whatever anime series I ripped it off from. I'm going to show you this one a bit differently and walk you through it so you get the full experience. We start off at chapter one, with Jack something or other getting a call to leap into his ship that he has, and because he's the best pilot on Earth, shoot down some alien invaders. Larry, come in. Tell me you know what's going on. What's going on, Jack, is we're being invaded. That's what's going on. I can see that. By who? Not so much who. More like what. Larry, you're my intelligence, right? Yes. Then start acting intelligent. You're not making any goddamn sense. Look, all I can tell you is that in the last two hours, an estimated 17 million people have vanished. What do you mean, vanished? I mean they have ceased to be where they were, as in they are no longer there. But... how? I don't know. Alright. So what do you know? I know that you're the best damn pilot on Earth, Jack, and right now you need to be lighting up the sky like a goddamn Christmas tree. Now that makes sense. Leave it to me. Make it rain, Jack. This leads to a very terrible horizontal shooting section which goes on forever, but eventually the plot kicks in again. Barry, come in. I can't keep this up much longer. There's too many of them. Have we got a plan yet? Yes, we have, actually. Well, do you mind filling me in? There's a... a big one nearby. A big one? Like a mothership or something. Right. Bring it down. No. Get inside. What? Jack, you're good, but unless you can circumnavigate the entire globe, we're going to need a worldwide attack strategy. So we need information. We need to find a weakness. But all I've got on me is my goddamn pistol. It'll have to do. You're the best, remember? Ugh, all right. You want me in the eye of the storm. I'm on my way. Good luck. Oh, hey, Larry, could you do me a favor? Yeah? Could you send someone to my place to check on Sandy? Already done. There's a squad going to her now. Thanks. Hey, it's what friends are for, right? Alright, I'm inside. What's the situation? I'm currently taking the bastards down with that whole infinite ammo thing you invented. Now what? I don't know. What? This was your idea. Jack, believe it or not, we don't exactly have a contingency plan for aliens have invaded and a billion people have vanished. Billion people? Jesus. Funny you should mention him. Some people are saying it's the rapture. Of course they are. Any excuse. In other news, the President of the United States just disappeared on live television. Huh. Guess he won't be getting re-elected. Oh hey, I found your missing people. What? Where? In some tubes. Some... tubes? Like containers or something. Full of goo. Is it pink goo? Yeah, actually. How did you know? Never mind. Have you got any ideas? Well, I saw a sign that said Control Room. What do you mean, you saw a sign? You read Alien? No, it was in English. Damn! Damn? That's... bad? There's no time. You need to get to that control room, Jack. Alright. I'm on it. Time to head into the mothership, where now we're on foot, and it's a twin-stick shooter in the style of Smash TV. Time for some aimless wandering around a maze level until the plot catches up via the medium of my brilliant pitch-shifted voiceover. Well, I'm inside the control room, but I don't think they're very happy to see me. Is there a computer? Huh? Yeah. Can you see it? Didn't you hear me? I'm kind of busy here. You don't have time to be busy. They're reporting three billion people now. And... Jack? Sandy's one of them. No. No! I'm, I'm sorry, but that's why you need to focus. Alright. What do you need? Can you see the monitor? Yeah, it's a... it's a list. Of what? Names, I think. Millions of them. Billions, even? Yeah, maybe. So it is them. Who? What the hell is going on? Jack, just- NO! Larry! I'm fighting for my goddamn life thousands of feet above the Earth against aliens that have kidnapped my goddamn wife. The least you can do is tell me why! Alright. I'm teleporting you back here. Just hold on a minute. I've been holding on all goddamn night. Oh no, aliens are at the control room. Time for what I think is meant to be a first-person on-rail shooter, 
for a bit, then we get some exposition, quite a lot of exposition, and learn the dark secret of this amazing science fiction conspiracy. Jack. Just talk, Larry, and make it fast. <sighs> Five years ago, we sent an unmanned spacecraft to a newly discovered planet. The ship was carrying some bacteria housed in a pink, nutrient-rich fluid, and a few robots loaded with information about humanity and what it would take to sustain life. If the environment was found to be stable, the robots were programmed to begin preparations to move a portion of humanity to the new planet. They had a list. What are you saying? The robots looked like this. So, they're robots? Not quite. Something must have gone wrong. My best guess is, something about the atmosphere of that new planet fused the bacteria to the robots, which began to self-replicate and continue their mission. It's a glitch, and now they've come back to take us all. But, isn't that okay? I mean, this new planet should sustain life, right? Life, sure, but not necessarily human life. Like I said, they glitched out. For all I know, they could be leading the entire human race to suffocate to death. So what do we do? We need to modify their directive. They should still have the same basic programming. Here, take this USB stick to the old laboratory to the east, where the robots were first constructed. Then what? I'll explain on the way. Just go! We're running out of time! And now we're in a 2D running gun platformer, racing to a laboratory to change the genetic code of a race of bacterial robot aliens, hell-bent on transporting all of humanity into space. So when I get there, I just plug this in and hit send or something? Like an email? That's about the gist of it, yeah. It should all still be set up. And then what? Hopefully it'll change their programming enough so that they'll keep everyone in stasis, until they've absolutely determined that it's safe for us to come out. So, everybody's going into space? Pretty much. There's nothing I can do about that now. I can't try and alter their programming too much. The risk of them rejecting it is just too high. Huh. Sandy always said she wanted to travel more. She'll be okay, right? If I'm right, that pink goo you saw is keeping everyone perfectly preserved. And if you're wrong? I'm never wrong, Jack. I hope not. This also goes on for way too long, but eventually... Okay, I made it. I've uploaded the code. I think. Great. Well done, Jack. You've saved us all. So, everybody's going to be fine now, right? Not... everybody. What do you mean? The bacteria we sent up with the robots. It had to be synthetically engineered from human DNA, so we decided we had to sample the best that we could. The best of us. You, Jack. So? What does that matter? Well, because the bacteria came from you, the robots, aliens, whatever they are, they see you as one of their own. They were attacking you probably because they thought you'd gone rogue. I don't understand. They think you're one of them, Jack. They'll never teleport you up like they will with the rest of us. So I'll be here... alone... forever? Yes, Jack, I'm afraid so. I see. Larry? Yeah? When you see Sandy, tell her that I love her. And even though we'll be galaxies apart, that'll never change. I will. Jack, I'm... I'm, I'm so... I'm... I'm so so- Larry! Larry! <laughs> Goodbye, Larry. So that's my story. There's no one here to hear it anymore, but... Uh, I don't know. I guess you have to say something before the end, right? What an incredibly heart-wrenching, well-written and very well-performed ending. I'm sure you're all in tears from the emotional weight of it all. But wait, there's more. As you play through the game, an invisible counter keeps track of your progress in the background. If you score over a certain threshold, you unlock the secret epilogue, which I'll play for you now. I guess I shouldn't keep shooting those rats. Pretty soon they're going to be the only things left for me to talk to. <sighs> what the hell do you do when you're the last man alive? Hey, what? Larry? <laughs> I thought you said you were never wrong. All's well that ends well. Jack gets to go back to his wife, humanity is moving to space, and everything is fine. Okay, I realised that was incredibly cheesy, the gameplay was incredibly boring, the art was awful and the voice acting was even worse. 
But despite all that, I'm pretty proud of this. As a reminder, this was a 48 hour game jam project, and I managed to pull together a four chapter video game with an actual plot that began, progressed and ended, and put it out in a workable state with a bonus epilogue across four different game genres. That I think is definitely something to be proud of. This has been about half of the games I still have access to, and if you've enjoyed this then please let me know and I'll cover the rest I've managed to salvage. The point of this video is that although my old projects might be hideous to look at and sometimes terminally dull, I think they show that I've always had at least some vague understanding of how to put a game together. It's also to show you that wherever you are on your own game developer journey, there's always a way forward, and it really doesn't matter at all if your early projects are terrible. In fact I think they're supposed to be because you'll learn a lot more from making a bad game than you will from a good one. If you've liked this video then remember to like this video and subscribe to see games that are hopefully more well made than these were, and I'll see you the next time I'm thinking hey, let's talk game design.